step in and say, do you need help? Do you need help? What, what do you need set up? You know, so, so work with each other at all times. We're back online. Oh, okay. Oh, so you take this beautiful drink, and then, uh, so before you, you got this nice chili glass here, and then uh, you take the rim and the lime, lemon, lime, put it right around there one time, and then twist it over the top, and then pour this. This is going to be a nice full drink because it's been sitting here for a couple minutes. But that looks beautiful, doesn't it? Now that's a nice looking drink. It's like, ooh, that's totally acceptable. It's about two and a half ounces of booze. So that's pretty good. Those, those really, that is the ideal size for, for a martini glass. Anything else is too big and it gets people too drunk too fast. So that's great. Uh, okay, so Manhattan is the other big drink. Okay, so one other thing about the martinis. So the question again is what? What are we asking? Are we going to Right. Twist them. <laughs> yes. Okay. Oh. Boom. All of the above. Yeah. So, so upper, upper on the rocks, back in the gym, twist right now. Everyone. I get this all the time. People come back. I'm, is she wanted a martini. Okay. We make martinis, but you need to do this, you know. Oh, all right. You know, because it's, it's a, it's a unless, you're, unless you've done it a lot, and you, you might not be familiar with it. So this is a time to get familiar with all these little drinks that you're going to see a lot of. It's the Manhattan's, the perfect Manhattan's, and the dry Manhattan's are next, okay? So it's the perfect Manhattan, the uh, standard Manhattan is two ounces of whiskey and half an ounce of sweet vermouth, okay? Standard Manhattan on the rocks, so you put in the stuff in a rock glass like this, and you say, okay, well, you just pour it. Just go ahead and pour a half ounce. I love these pour spots. <coughs> with, the, with the Manhattans, pour the vermouth on the bottom. I think it works better. Um, because, it because it doesn't, instead of floating it on top where they get that vermouth flavor right away, you want the vermouth to just kind of mellow into the drink because it's really, it should be in the, it's a background flavor. And you want to take that sip on the top. So you want to put that vermouth down, bury it down in the ice a little bit. And they just get the stir stick and they'll take a little sip and they'll get it that way, or they'll just sip it and it'll come through. But you don't want to overwhelm the drink by floating the vermouth on top. Okay. Um, so, okay, so you do a half ounce of sweet vermouth, and then you do two ounces of uh, whiskey, all right, bar whiskey, blended whiskey. Look at that, there's a two and a half ounce drink in a glass that size, and that is all you need. Okay, that is a, that is a big drink. It's a beautiful drink. Uh, so in a Manhattan, you're always going to add a regular uh, Manhattan. is always going to get a cherry. Okay. Well, you put the cherry on a little stick? Or yeah, sword in? picks. We need sword picks. Also. Okay, um, we, didn't, we didn't have any here. Um, but yeah, you want to, and if you're going to be real busy, you can preload the sword picks with like three cherries and three olives. So the other thing about that is it's kind of cool to do because um, it saves you time when you're busy, and you're going to be busy if you got a wedding event with 50 people that need a drink at one time. So the cherry things take a while, but if you're already set, man, you got them on the, the sword pick, boom, you're done. Because a lot of times when you're busy and you're chasing a little olive around the fruit tray, I'm telling you, it can be maddening. Because you don't want to go in there and you don't want to go in there and like put your fingers on it and become the customer either. You can do that before they come, and then they'll put it on the stick, and it's like, oh, daintily pick that sword pick up and put it in the glass, so they don't see you handling the fruit, you know. So that's a that's kind of a uh, an easy time saver. Just do uh, think about all the things you can do when you're setting up the bar to make your job easier later on. That's really that's that's a big part of the bar take. Organizing everything consistently. Make sure you have plenty of fruit. I don't think I mentioned it uh, for the fruit that you what you're going to have is you come in if you've done a couple parties in a row, like in two days in a row, you're going to have yesterday's fruit. Okay. And it's really important that you look at yesterday's fruit and give it a squeeze, do a color check. Lemons and oranges look like they're good for like a week, but if you touch them and they're a few days old, you know that it's gone south. So always do a squeeze check on the lemons and the oranges. And on the limes, you can tell. You can tell. The lime will go brown in 24 hours. Never use uh, bad fruit. There's no, there's no reason to. You just go in and you throw the old fruit out if it's not presentable. Do a squeeze check and do a visual inspection of the limes, and if you can use it, use it, because there's no sense in wasting good fruit. But if it's brown and, or, or squishy, you can't 
You just can't use it. Because you're going to have a beautiful drink and then you're going to put a brown lime in there. And that is just like an insult to the customer. They're paying for that? I would, I would look at that and say, man, there's somebody that doesn't give a darn about us because they didn't have the, uh, they couldn't afford one fresh lime for, for me. You know what I mean? So that's a big thing. It's a big thing. So quality ingredients, fresh ingredients. The same goes with your juices, your milks, stuff like that. Always try and check those before the shift, but if it's even during the shift and all of a sudden you're, oh, you got a call for a milk trick, just be discreet about checking the date, you know what I mean? Just kind of get down and you got to look at it and say, okay, you know, that's good. But you don't want to do a sniff check and say, yeah, I think this smells good. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you know what? <laughs> you drink that one, you know? So you have to be careful. Um, pineapple juice uh, goes bad fairly quickly. That turns brown. Uh, it's only got a shelf life of a few days, really, when you're looking at it. I didn't mention with the wine thing, you know, your cork and wines after you're done with a, with a bottle and it's not complete. Um, they've done, like, taste tests. Wine doesn't last more than a few days. Red wines, <coughs> they should be served at about 50 degrees, okay? Not room, room temperature in France last century when they said serve red wine at room temperature. Yeah, it was always, like, 50 degrees. You know what I mean? It was cold. It wasn't 68. So... 68 is, is kind of warm for wines of any kind. So um, you want to keep it, I, mean, I don't want to say you, wanna, you don't want to keep it in the chiller, but uh, you don't want to keep it in the warm spot either. But when you're done with the, serving the wines for the day, what you want to do is you want to cork them and put them in the fridge. And they'll last for about three days. <laughs> but after that, use them for cooking. That's it, because that's all they're good for, honestly. Um, so you have to be careful about you have an event, and you're like, okay, let's open a bunch of wines. Uh, don't do that. Uh, what you want to do is you just want to take the foil off all the tops, okay? And then you can open the wines really quickly because you've done the major time, time step. You've saved a major uh, amount of time by just taking the foil off the, the, the bottle, right? And now all you have to do is jam a thing in there. So if you know you're going to use half a dozen bottles, yeah, open them all up because it's going to save you time. Pour them. But after you do six... Don't do any more, you know. So you really need to be aware of how much wine you're going to serve. Open the appropriate amount. What you don't use, the reds will stay in the fridge. The whites will stay in the fridge for a few days. They say that if you could find a smaller, well, this is a catering operation. You can't really do this. You can't transfer booze into and, or wine into smaller bottles. But that would save if you can marry some bottles. Uh, if you have white wine left over and you've got a couple of half bottles sitting there from different tables coming back. You can marry those and then cork them because the less air in each individual bottle, the better it will uh, preserve or, or prevent the aging. Just the air exposed to the wine is what ages it, and then the temperature is the other thing that ages it. Okay? So that, that's a way to uh, reduce the aging uh, process. Okay, so back to the Manhattan. So we've got the, the sweet Manhattan, the regular Manhattan, sweet vermouth, and bar whiskey, okay, two and a half ounces total drink. Half ounce sweet vermouth, two ounces of booze. All right, and then the next thing we'll do is a perfect Manhattan. Now that just gets a quarter ounce each of the sweet and the dry vermouth, and then two ounces of whiskey on top. Well, you don't need to write the ingredients down because we've got them, I've got them written down for you. Okay, and we'll take care of that. Um, uh, so, uh, so you got a quarter ounce of each of the sweet and dry, and then perfect. The perfect always gets a twist. That's just the way it is. That's how it is. Uh, uh, a dry Manhattan is half ounce of dry vermouth and two ounces of whiskey, and that always gets a twist also. The next thing is a Rob Roy. It's a Scotch Manhattan. And if people say a dry Rob Roy, that means dry vermouth. And so Manhattans, it's when you order dry, it doesn't mean less sweet vermouth. It means dry vermouth. But martinis, when you say dry, it means no dry vermouth. So a little ambiguity there, but, you, uh, but you'll, you're professionals. You can sort that out. Uh, but it's, uh, Rob Roy is a Scotch Manhattan. So you're going to put the uh, vermouth and the, and the scotch in there. And then that gets a cherry. Unless it's a dry Rob Roy, then it's going to get dry vermouth and scotch and uh, twist. Okay. Um, that is, that's the builds. Or that's the, uh, hop, the uh, rock streaks. Here's the thing. Uh, I didn't mention yet, but here's a major thing about uh, slowing your customer down a little bit, making sure they don't get too buzzed to drive. They're drinking. You're serving them a drink. 
<clears throat> when you're serving them, when you're serving them wine, and you're serving them on the rocks drinks, you're serving them straight booze or highly concentrated alcoholic beverage. That's why we have water all the time. So you always, whenever you're serving a glass of wine or a uh, rock drink, and this saves on cost too, because a lot of times you're not doing a cash bar at a catering event. You're doing uh, your open bar for an hour, and so you want to slow people down as much as you can and make sure they're uh, going to drive home safely. So water, water, and they appreciate it. And this is something that I always do anywhere I'm at: is give the person that orders a glass of wine a glass of ice water on the side. The person that orders a uh, Drink, uh, black Russian martini, Manhattan, straight booze, drink, glass of water on the side. I say, thank you. Some, some old timers understand it. Some people say, what's that for? I say, in case you get thirsty. They go, oh, oh, I got it, yeah. Because, you know, we're here to drink. But, you know, when you get thirsty, you don't want to drink vodka for thirst. You want to drink water and sip the vodka. You know, I mean, that's just, that's how you drive home safe. You're not killing anybody. So, Water. You can't get enough water to the customer, and that, that's a really important thing. Um, shoot, we are moving right through this stuff. Oh, the muddled old fashioned, we didn't go over. Um, we don't have any bitters, but Angostura bitters is it's aromatic bitters. It's been around since like 1724. Um, some guy in the village of Angostura in Venezuela invented this stuff. He was like a, one of those funky early doctors, right? So. So well, yeah, if you put a little of this ground leaf in here and some herbs and spices, you know, and put this on your, pour it over your head, then your headache will go away. But, I don't know, people said, whoa, it's really red, it kind of stains. Maybe what if we put it in a drink? They said, oh, that's even better. So they started making, like, cocktails. So that, they would make this Angostura bitters and put a little dash of the bitters in there. So it's a multi-purpose thing, uh, Angostura bitters. It's, it's, by itself, it's like 40% alcohol by volume. But you're only using two drops, so it's technically it's uh, two dashes. It's it's considered a non-alcoholic ingredient. Two, you could put it in a kitty cocktail or an alcoholic's drink. Uh, you know, they say, well, I'll just give you a couple of a couple of dashes, not going to kill you. Um, you can. It also will cure um, the hiccups. Angostura bitters on a lemon. If you take a lemon and put a pack of sugar there and put a few dashes of bitters and hold it upside down on your tongue for like 10 seconds and then take it out it'll cure your hiccups I don't, th I don't think it's ever failed me so um, I'm a firm believer in that one so um, with a muddled old fashioned however we'll get to this uh, drink and what you do is you take a half packet of sugar and two dashes of the bitters half packet of sugar and then you take an orange and a cherry and throw them right in there take an orange cherry, you throw them right in the glass. Now this is going to be, this is what you use the half, the half oranges for, because you don't really want to, you don't want to cut full, full wheels. So you gush it all in there, gush it all up, get a good glop going on there, put a little bit about, uh, just a stash of soda water, just to, just to cover all the sugar so it collapses in there, you get a nice, uh, you get a nice little mixture in there, and then you pack the glass with ice, and then just pour booze on top, two to two and a half ounces of bar whiskey or bourbon. And uh, the standard pours like whiskey in some parts of the world, it's the other half uses bourbon. I use whiskey, blended whiskey. Um, it's up to the person, it's a, and you can ask them. If a waitress comes to you and say, make an old fashioned, muddle old fashioned, well, make it with blended whiskey. But if a customer's in front of you, ask them, what do you think, bourbon? Anything? You know, uh, same with like a, a suggestive sell in Manhattan. How about a nice Southern Comfort Sweet Manhattan? or a Southern, Southern Comfort muddled Old Fashioned. Those are killer drinks. Uh, and again, you have to be aware of how much booze is in these drinks. So these are two ounce, two and a half, two to two and a half ounce drinks of, you know, 40 uh, percent by volume booze. So it's 80 proof stuff we're looking at. Now there's two drinks. I worked at a place in Buffalo. It was called Classic Spy. This is going back 20 something years ago. And it was a fish fry joint, and uh, little old ladies loved it. And they would come up and have two Manhattans before dinner. And a space of like 25 minutes, they'd suck, suck down a couple of Manhattans. And our rocks glasses were 10 ounce rocks glasses. And I'm telling you, there was three ounces of booze in every Manhattan we put over that bar if there was an ounce. And so these ladies would have six shots 
before they got up and teetered to their little table to get the fishy, fishy fry. And they were loving life. It was a Friday. It was their big thing, you know. But man, oh man, that's <laughs> old style drinking. But we're now we got a we got a new style of drinking now, and that stuff doesn't happen anymore. We have to be <coughs> aware at all times of just what we're doing behind the bar, because it's life and death consequences all the time. We have kids, uh, people people dying on the streets every day. There's uh, 10,000 people in 2010 were killed by uh, drunk drivers. Either drunk drivers have killed themselves or others. How, I mean, how do you really, you know, a lot of times the guy or the girl will go up and get two, three drinks, but they might be for them, might be, right. you know, now you and don't know kid. how many they're really taking in. Right. Well, you have to, you have to kind of watch. You're responsible for the room, unfortunately. Uh, you're responsible for everybody's consumption in it. Um, the one thing that you, that is on your side legally is that you can't serve underage and you can't serve visibly intoxicated. Those are the two rules you have to live by and, and really strive to live by. By that I mean ID everybody under 30, okay? Everybody under 30 gets ID, no questions. And uh, for multiple deliveries like that, you, gotta, you, gotta, you have to watch where that other person is. You have to ask them, who is this other one for if it's a mixed age party, number one. And then, okay, what are you drinking? Who's drinking these? You know, who's driving? Got to know. You know, you know, first round, but the second round when they come up and start, it's okay, so how many designated drivers do we have at this party? You know, because is that a, do you have a designated driver at your table? Okay, you got to be up front with the people, really. It's the, the days of, of just serving people till they're sloppy drunk are over. There's a problem between reconciling, reconciling the difference between drunk drive dr intoxicated people and visibly intoxicated people. That's two different things. You can know that they're intoxicated if you figure, okay, I'm going to do a rough body count, you know, drink count on that. Okay, so I've got these cards, uh, and they say, all right, well, you know, uh, green is go. It's .04 or less, so that's, you know, two drinks or less in an hour. Uh, yellow is caution, .05 to .7, .07. That's impaired can be arrested. So there's two or three drinks. So you have to keep you have to you have to keep track of where your people are at. It's unfortunate, but you really have to do that. In Buffalo, there's a famous case that probably made the papers here in Rochester a couple of years ago. There was a doctor who uh, was yeah. drinking at a country club all day, all day. He was at a function, had a golf outing, as doctors do. They get off work, they have a couple at the country club. And I uh, was drinking with some friends in a golf outing and then a couple glasses of wine with dinner. And at midnight, he left the uh, country club and hit a girl on a skateboard and killed her. Now, he was texting while driving, at, drunk at midnight on a dark street, and uh, never even, and he didn't even stop. So the girl dies, uh, and they, the, the guy gets arrested. He's at the country club. and. Uh, what did they say? They caught him five hours afterwards. They took his blood alcohol level. Five hours later, it was 0.10. He was still drunk at that level. Five hours later. Now this guy was a he was a he was a guy probably 180, 190, uh, stocky build, and uh, he probably eliminated maybe 0.02 uh, drink 0.02 alcohol content per hour. Five hours. So that's five drinks. He was over limit. So so he was. Five hours later, he was, he was still way wasted. But when he got in that car, he was 0.20, five hours previous, previous to that. OK, if he lost one drink an hour. All right, that 0.20, that's visibly intoxicated. There's no way of getting around. You can't drink to that level of intoxication without being apparently invisibly drunk to everybody around you. This is the biggest thing where we can save the most lives. There's 10,000 people died in 2010 from drunk driving. And 70% of those deaths were caused by people that were 0.15 or better. Okay? That's visibly intoxicated. All you need to do, all we need to do as bartenders, is get those people off of the road. Okay? We could save 7,000 lives a year. Okay? But it's up to us. You have to refuse the visibly intoxicated. It's, make it just, it's no longer acceptable. It's not happening. But the decision rests with us. And we have to be proactive about it. And you, it's just what you got to do. You got to submit. You're getting them there. You can't take them there and then strand them. Okay. Ideally, as a bartender, people are coming up and you're and you're pacing them. 
Okay, they aren't in charge of the party like you think. They're, they think they're in charge of the party. They're just going to keep drinking. Well, if they come up and get the third drink in the first 20 minutes, hey, dude. Then you let them know, all right, you're on the way. Are you driving? Just be flat out. Who's driving today? Because I'm just telling you, you can't serve intoxicated people. Because if you're, you know, you're going to go that route, fine. As long as you don't get sloppy drunk, if you're not visibly intoxicated, you can handle yourself. And I know that you may be too, have had too much to drive, but you've got a designated driver. That puts a little different spin on things. If you can tell me that you're here for a special occasion and you've got a designated driver, I might see visibly intoxicated differently than I would see it in somebody else. As long as they're you know, behaving themselves and, and not really swaying and stuff like that, you know that they're being taken care of. It's, it's easier to let that go, but you never let it go when you see people going down the road to intoxication and saying, hey, you know, you, you, you cut them off and then you got to find a ride home. You know, you are responsible, really. So be aware of where they're at. To get back to your question, you, you, wanna, you have to be aware of everybody in the room. This green, yellow, red, I might as well pass these cards out so you can get a look at them. These are good. These are good to have. These are good to have. Um, uh, it's just bar, it's bar information that you can have um, at your ready, stash it in your back pocket. Um, and it's, there's like the like number of a cab, there's um, how to tell uh, you know, the strength of a drink and, uh, and uh, what happens at certain blood alcohol levels and stuff like that. So it's good to have in your pocket. I've, um, I've, had, I've tried these out at the bar and I've set them on the bar top. Where I work, and uh, and just to see what would happen. You know what happens when people see this? People read them because it's like, wow, it's green, yellow, red. What is it? It's like a stop sign thing, right? So they they read them, and it's like, wow, okay. Well, this is just a reminder. You don't have to put it front and center, but if you put it somewhere where it's handy, what it does is it it it's a facilitates the conversation among your bar crowd about the most important thing that they can that affects their lives is the amount that they're drinking tonight at the bar, where they're at. So you got to occupy their bar stool with the message of drinking and driving to excess isn't acceptable. So you've got this thing here, and, and this is, you know, I've used this and it works, but people uh, at the same, other places where I've given this uh, alcohol training have, have said, well, you know, I don't want to drive away my customers. Driving away your customers by what? By, well, they don't need to get that message about drunk driving at my joint. I'm like, well, why don't they? I mean, you got to give people the message where it can have the greatest effect, and that's at the bar stool when they're drinking. It's not enough to tell the bartenders in the class here, uh, geez, you know, uh, you know, you got to, you got to interrupt, you got to uh, interject and, and really <coughs> control people's drinking. If you bring that conversation started with the people that are at your bar, and not a, not a preachy kind of way either. This, as I said, you know, I just put these out in the bar, and people look at them and they see what that is. Say green, yellow, red, better safe than sorry or dead. Okay, I kind of get that. No more excuses. Okay, and then that the conversation starts between them. You know, and this card gives them information that they can use to make informed decision about whether maybe they. Maybe it can save some lives. You know, I mean, this is this is just some. It's it's one way to get the message out there and across. Anyways, um, so we have to be very aware of where people are at in the drinking continuum, um, and proofing and uh, multi multi drink delivery is the other thing. But the uh, visibly intoxicated, slurred speech. Bloodshot eyes, people weaving, uh, people uh, just sounding drunk when they're, they're talking, and, and, uh, and inappropriate behavior is another thing. Uh, I had a truck driver in a couple weeks ago, and these guys are, they come in every other Saturday, they're golfers. They go to the golf dome in Tonawan or wherever it is, and they come in and they drink. And this guy was saying, you know what, I haven't had anything on the rocks today. I'm going to have one on the rocks. He said, dude, are you driving? 
Yeah, but you know what? I drive better drunk. How many times have you heard people say this over the years? How stupid is that? It's a stupid thing to say. It's not true. It's just not true. You can't drive better drunk. You don't. You can't. It's physically impossible. But the guy's saying, yeah, I drive better drunk. I, I know all the cops on duty in Hamburg, where the barn is. And plus, I've been doing this for so many years, I'm, I'm practiced at it. I said, dude, they've done studies about repetitive behavior. Um, you can, you can uh, do the same repetitive task, even if you're intoxicated, except if you're throwing a curve, then there's no, there's, everything goes out the window. So all you need to do is, okay, you are driving that same route home, and you've had six beers and two hours, and you're just borderline drunk, and you're okay, and then somebody crosses the road in front of you, and you've got to swerve or do something, that means that you're ref you're, that throws everything out the window. A new stimulus was added to the equation, and your body can mind can't cope, and then you're in trouble. So it's really it's a thing about wow, man, you don't drive better drunk. Nobody does. And to hear that from somebody, a guy who's been driving 20 years, knows all the cops in Hamburg, was really discouraging for me because I said to the guy, you know, dude, I mean, I then I said, well, look, are you going to risk you risk that on a regular basis? Honestly. This is your job. I got to tell you, I had a brother-in-law who lost his job uh, because he was an over-the-road guy, and he got a DWI, and he was just light, like a couple of beers over, like one beer over, and so they suspended his license, and then he got a second one. How stupid is that? And the next two years, the guy hasn't driven in five years. His wife takes him everywhere. How bad is that? You know, I mean, this is stupid, stupid stuff. Drinking and driving can have serious consequences, not to mention the going out and killing somebody and stuff. So there's a there's a lot of a lot of bad things, but you you have to you have to be willing to commit <coughs> to making people to getting the drunks off the street. Drunk drivers, people at 0.15 or better, are 480 times more as likely to be in a fatal car wreck as a sober driver. 480 times. Okay? That's a lot. That's a lot. Okay, that's a big number. So um, when you get to that level, you can see people that are visibly intoxicated. It's time to get them off the road. When you are cutting somebody off, it's firm, fair, final. That's it, firm, fair, final. Discreet is the other thing. You don't want to say, hey, dude, you are up. Okay? You are <laughs> gone, dude, in front of all his friends. Dude, you cannot have a drink. You know what I mean? No, no, no. You want to be the friend and say, dude, I just can't serve you. you know, it's, you know, look, I gotta show you this, you know, it's, it's, vis it's, it's illegal, I just can't do it, you know, it's against the law, and I know you're visibly intoxicated, it's, it's in you're intoxicated, I can't serve you, legally, I can't. Uh, you can always do anything else for them, any non-alcoholic beverage is on the house for drunks, and I don't care, where, where I've worked, they've never objected to that, you take care of the people that you got drunk, now, you, now they're your responsibility. So the trick is to not get them drunk. You keep keep an eye on things and make feed them and you know and try your best to limit the consumption. <coughs> what if you have two bars and they're working both ends? <coughs> yes, that's when you really and this happens all the time too. There's two bars in the place where I where I work, and uh, I go over to the people at the other bar. If I know somebody's on the way, I'll go over and talk to the other bartender or get a uh, waiter, server, manager, and say, "Dude, he is. He can't do that." And tell him he's done. Uh, about a month ago, we had another guy who was a well-dressed guy in his 60s. Friday night, he's drinking wine. And I asked his friends how he was. He seemed a little tipsy. Oh, he's fine. We'll take care of him. I said, okay, but he's not drinking anymore because I'm not serving him anymore. Okay, fine. We'll take care of him. And so I served him water. He goes, can I get a wine? I said, no, I can't serve anymore. And your friend said they'd drive you home, by the way. But I'm going to give you water, coffee, anything you want. I'll give it to you. All right, all right. So I'm busy, busy running up and down there. He's over here. And uh, he goes to the other bar. And by that time, I had already told the other guys, I'm cutting this guy off just as a heads up. So they knew. He goes over to the bar, he gets refused. The other bar gets refused service. Comes back to me. And I can see him sipping his water. And then I'm turning away, taking care of business. And what's he doing? He's sipping his friend's drinks. He's, sipping, he's drinking his friend's little red wine. And it was like behind their back, they're talking. He's like slugging the wine. Oh, dude. I called the doorman over. I said, look, I'm telling you. I'm going to tell this guy he's got to have a ride home. And if he gets in his car, 
I want you to go in there and take his keys away. And that's what ended up happening. I told the guy, I said, look, you're not driving, right? Oh, I'm not driving. And I told the bartender, when he goes, watch him. Sure enough, I turned my back, and two seconds, the guy's halfway to the door. I, the doorman went out, followed him to his car, grabbed his keys out of the ignition. His friends, I had a talk with his friends. I said, hey, you said to me that you were going to take care of your friends. Yeah, yeah, well, we didn't see him leave. Oh, you're killing me. I said, we got his keys. So, you know, if he was going to leave, I was going to have him arrested. If he would have got that far, I would have had him arrested. That's the final thing. If somebody, you've made the mistake, and you, you got them all that drunk up, don't let them go. Do they ever get violently with you? Yeah, but you know what? I'm on the other side of the bar. When I was younger, I made a mistake of doing this. I had cut a guy off, and uh, the guy, he was, a, he was a Vietnam vet, and he was kind of post-traumatic stress syndrome. This is down in the D.C. cop bar, and he was a rough area town. And uh, I cut the guy off, and I was like, wow, man, I don't know. This guy was a pretty scary individual. So he goes, hey, brother, come here, I understand. And he reaches over and he shakes my hand. But you know what? He wouldn't let go. <laughs> I'm standing there looking at the guy like, oh, wow, okay, all right. So, and, you know, trying to, he's like got an iron grip. I was like, wow. So he, he had me there, and he knew that he had me there for about a minute. And I was like, wow, you know what? I'm never going to reach over the bar and shake a drunk's hand like that again. You never want to make physical, physical contact with the people whose drink you're taking away or you're cutting off. And there's the other thing. If, you, if somebody comes up to the bar and you realize, ah, I just served him that drink. He was drunk. I didn't realize it when they ordered, but you can see now that you got a good look at them that they're drunk. Well, you know what? You wait till they're not looking, or you just wait till you have that second to put the drink down. Take that drink right away. Say, here's your money back. Can I get you a water or anything? Okay, it's good. I can't serve you, just so you know. And and you know, and they can get mad, or they can you know they can take it in stride. But it's firm, it's final, it's friendly. It's done. <coughs> you know, and that's it. You've done your job, and that's really the most Mar important thing. Why do you? I I I where you were talking earlier about sort of bringing people along and talking to them about this at the beginning. I I mean that sounds so key to me. Can you talk a little bit more about that? About bringing people. Well, when when you when they're when they're starting to drink and they may be beginning to have too much. Right. How you handle that? Talking about do you have a ride? You yeah, know, yeah, yeah, right. You're here with other people. That can you talk a little about that? Your, your prevention your sounds important. Yeah, you're reading your customer. Okay, and you're and you got to be in tune with them. So, I, I've got uh, occupy the barstool uh, dot com. That's one of the websites that I have. It just leads me to the green, yellow, red uh, web website. But it's, you have to occupy the bar stool each and every drink. You have to get inside the person's head in front of you and find out what their mission is tonight. You know what I mean? Everybody has a different mission, a different reason to drink. Why are they there? Catering, they're here for a group party. But they always have an agenda in mind. There's a drinking agenda and a social agenda. And everybody has both of those. Okay? Whether the people are aware of the drinking agenda, the light drinkers, very moderate, very occasional drinkers, they don't have much of a drinking agenda, but people who are repeat offenders, heavy drinkers are the ones that we need to get off the road because they're repeat offenders, and they've got a drinking agenda, and they're fairly easy to spot. Okay, they're the people that drink quickly, okay, and they come up and they want doubles, okay, and they want big strength drinks, and they're knocking them back pretty hard. Those are the people you want to, you know, you want to say, hey, you know, just get a sense of who they are, what are they doing, or what's, what's up, what are you doing tonight? Are you going to hang here for a little while and listen to the band, or what's up? Oh, no, i got to go pick up my kids. Well, you don't want to hear that from a guy who just slammed two quick beers and, and, and a shot or something. You know? oh, i got to go pick up my kids. Oh, man, don't tell me that. Does anybody ever ask for, like, very small <coughs> ice in their drink? Or yeah. Or do you ever get a little stronger of a... Yeah, but you know what, you never... You, all you do is you make the same strength drink, but you don't... You, you just add more, you just add more mixer, and so um, I think it's people with uh, sensitive teeth is how I would take that. But I do get that frequently. I yeah. think like or if somebody wants it on like vodka on the rocks, yeah, and they're thinking with less ice they're going to get. Well, oh, he's going to fill that glass up. Yeah, no, that's when the jigger's handy. Yeah, say, hey, dude, there's two shots, and then there's no argument. Oh, it's the same thing. Oh, could you, why don't you fill it up, please? Yeah. Okay, that's good. You know, so yeah, you get that. But yeah, that's a good, good question. You know, you just you have to really be in tune, read your people, 
create the dialogue, you know, create the dialogue, <coughs> talk, to, talk to the people that, that are there in front of you. As bar, a matter of bar etiquette, you don't want to jump in and overwhelm and be the, you know, the host of the party. Hi, how are you? My name is Marty. I'm going to do all that. You know, it's like, you've got to be restrained a little bit. See where the people are at. If they want to talk to you, then by all means, jump in there and have fun with them. But if it's a couple that's sitting at the bar and a nice quiet drink after dinner, you don't want to go over there and overwhelm them with your stuff. You know, you just, you just want to be a friendly, standoffish kind of guy. You know, you don't want to be hitting on the guy's wife or something. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, it's not appropriate behavior, you know. But uh, you just kind of just let, let, let them have fun because you can see that they're a nice couple. And you're, just, you're going to talk to the guy, not the girl. And the girls talk to the ladies and ignore the guy. And, and that's how it is. I mean, it's just, it's good bar etiquette, you know what I mean, to, to, to do that with a, with a couple situation. Um, Let's see. What did we cover? What did we not cover? How are we doing time wise here? Um, back off. Oh, the other thing. Never address um, people at the bar as guys. You know what I mean? I go, my wife and I go into a place and somebody said, Hey guys, how you doing? I'm like, you know what? Don't do that. I say, hey folks, folks is always good. Hi folks. Um, okay, uh, let's do a shake and drinks. Uh, the only thing I think we haven't covered, um, and this won't take much. If you have shaking drinks, we got. What kind, I'm trying to think what kind of shaking drinks you make a catering with. I've got on the we list. Don't know I've got, we're new at this. Huh? We don't know we're new at this. You know, White Russians. Well, you might want to buy a bottle of. You know what? Yeah. Don't buy Kahlua, Don't buy Kahlua though for a catering event unless you're going to have uh, a top shelf party. Get cream, uh, dark cocoa is fine for white, for white Russians at a gig like that, a catering gig. They'll drink it because it's free. Okay, it's included in the thing. I'll do a white Russian. And actually, those are pretty popular at catering <coughs> events. Uh, wedding events like that. And if you've got uh, ingredients for a white Russian, you're... Do you use cream or milk? I use milk. I use milk. Um, and I, I make them short. Um, and you can also pop, pop three... Uh, Three creamers will get you a nice shaken drink. An ounce of vodka, an ounce of Kahlua, and three portable creamers. They aren't, ref you know, they're a kind that don't have to be refrigerated or anything. <laughs> you never have to worry about them spoiling, and you got them stashed in a cupboard somewhere, and boom, you need it, it's right there for you. And there's no waste, there's no spill. You're not opening a quart of milk where who knows where that's going to spill. You know, on you at a catering gig. So, uh, really, uh, yeah, probably in the back seat of the van on the way home. It's like you won't smell that. You won't get rid of that for months. So, the White Russians. Um, so you just take it. Uh, they always try and when you get good at this. You always try and make the drink in a shaking glass and a shaking tin itself. Okay, so you you add uh, get all the ingredients into the tin. I usually, I usually make them right in the big tin, and you take that, so you scoop, scoop, scoop some ice in there with a the little tin, and you got this, and you pour in the vodka, and then you pour the Kahlua, and then you put the creamer in there, and then you're shaking it up, and you get to know exactly how much, um, how much a drink weighs in a in a tin, and so it's kind of cool because you can, you kind of like wow your customers, um, they see a. See, geez, this guy's pretty good. You know, you can fill that right up to the top, um, like this glass. So, oh, geez, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna fill it right up. Boom, and that's like okay. If you shake it, it's gonna be a little frothy. Uh, you, uh, White Russians, you don't want to shake them too much. Just very gentle on the shaking thing. Uh, same with the uh, Long Island iced teas. You give them a little more something. Long Island iced teas, you're doing half ounce each. The maximum strength drink. Two and a half ounces. That's it. No more. No more. It's not like, oh yeah, you know, give me an ounce. It's not an ounce of vodka, gin, rum, triple sec tequila. It's a half ounce of each, and that's a strong drink. And then there's two and a half, two and a half ounces of sweet and sour. They get served in a real tall glass, the tallest one you have. Good. It'd be good if you had a 14 ounce Collins, because you shake it, you had a big gush of coke on top. And uh, you never want to when you're making a shake and drink. You're making a Tom Collins. It's gin, sweet and sour, and uh, soda water. A little bit pack of sugar. So you put the gin in there and the sweet and sour, but you don't put the soda water in the shaker tin because you'll take all the bubbles out of it, right? So you, you pour that. When you go to pour that, you pour the soda and the Collins mix in at the same time so the bubbles 
are coming right up through the drink. If you don't have a spare hand, if one's got to go in before the other, put the soda or the carbonated beverage on the bottom. And the bubbles come up through it. If you have like even non-alcoholic drinks, it sounds simple, but I get this all the time. If you're ordering a cranberry and soda in a bar, and they put the cranberry on the bottom and the soda water on top, it's kind of like, hmm, that doesn't really work because the cranberry doesn't bubble up. But if you put the bubbles on the bottom, the cranberry on top, the bubbles right up, and you get a nice, even, consistent drink. So that's just a little, you know, something, something to throw out there. Uh, but that uh, White Russians and, uh, boy, I don't want to say I think we're about there, but I think we're about there. Um, the first drink is based on service, not on taste, OK? So people don't know how that first drink that you're getting tastes. Um, so they don't know if you made it good or not, or not. But what they seeing and what they're tipping you on is presentation. Did you smile? Did you know? I mean, here's the whole thing: customer service is the most important thing. So instant, instant acknowledgement. Okay, friendly smile. Favnap, mark their spot. How are you? What can I get you? Don't smile. This is great. You having fun today? Yeah. You worry for all good. You know. And you you do your thing. And then if it's a cash bar. While you're making the drink, you're adding the drinks in your head. Okay, you got a multi multi drink order. You got three beers and, and a top shelf and a glass of wine, so you got uh, fourteen fifty. Okay, you know that by the time you present the drink to the customer. Okay, you should know that because otherwise you're going back at the register. Or you're figuring it out. You're just holding up commerce. You know what I mean? It's dollars per minute when you're at an event. You're bartending. The more dollars, the more drinks you push over the bar in an hour, the more money's coming your way. Okay, so it's, it's dollars per minute. So if you're holding yourself up by doing, by waiting to do the math until you get to the register, you're, you're shortchanging yourself, okay? So if you can, do the, do the math in your head while you're doing the drinks, all right? That's, that's a big thing. The other real big thing about presenting the tip, you go over here and you say, make change, oh, that's 14.50. Don't give them a five and five and 50 cents out of 20. Always give people plenty of ones to tip you. Big, big point. Big point. I work with so many bartenders that don't get this. You gotta give them a lot of money. It's nine bucks. You're gonna, and they give you twenty. Give them a five and six ones. Because what's a twenty percent tip on nine dollars? It's two bucks. It's not a dollar. It's two bucks. So, you know, get it, get them. Um, you know, a lot of times we'll have the host order the open bar for X number of mm -hmm. hours and they're paying. What's your take on putting out a tip jar? Or Here's what I do. You know what I do? I, I throw this, I'll, I, I do it discreetly. I, I just, when I, when I start and, and people, after I get my first customer and they walk away from the bar, I just kind of, I put one up there. Okay? And then it's discreet and then the next person that comes up there, you front load the tip jar. And then you take them, you can take them down, you can take them down and just leave one up there and just stash them underneath the bar. But do you no, think it's appropriate it's great. to encourage tipping when somebody, a host, is already paying for the bar, you know, you know or that, do you think that's kind of rude? We've always been kind of on the mindset, like, maybe it's kind of rude. All right, you know? well, yeah, you know, I, I, worked, I worked it both ways, but, you know, at, at you know, a catered event, like a wedding, people do want to tip, and uh, they, you might as well get them started. But, yeah, but not front and center like that, where they've got it all when you go into McDonald's, anywhere but McDonald's probably now, you know, the convenience store. They make you a sub, you got to tip another dollar, you know, come on. Yeah. Well, so everybody gets tipped now, but bartenders, you know, I mean, you should, you should leave them that option to tip you. But do it in a very discreet way. So if you're called out, say, oh, you know, if somebody comes over and says, ah, I'm not comfortable with the tip chair, well, okay, you know, people are leaving it. But so you don't want to put it up on the bar, Put it. I would, I would put it beneath the bar. Here's a great spot for it because they just they fall right down. You know what I mean? So thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. And then, you know, you always always leave one up and always prime the pump with the one, but not till after the first customer because you don't want to make it look like you put it there. Okay. <laughs> so that that's the thing. And the other thing is there is a, a point in a cash bar where you're either going to get the tip every time or you're not, and it's the point where you say thank you very much and present the money. Okay? And if you look away and give them out, give them an out, they'll put that money in the pocket a lot of times if they're not tippers. But if you maintain the smile and the eye contact, psh, you've shamed them into a tip. <laughs> because you are their friend. You smiled with them, you made them happy, you gave them a good drink, and they're going to give you a dollar for that. 
So that's that's a that's a key too. I work with bartenders, you know, too many that don't get that, and that's it's really important. You can make a lot of extra money just by holding that, holding the thank you at the at the at the at the very end of the transaction. <coughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Hi. Thanks for stopping by at the beginning. Thank you for the tip at the end. You know. Thank you very much. So that's I feel about handling cash and then touching proof. That's this is why I this is why I get you know you're keeping your hands clean at all times. You've got a here you've got a hand washing sink which is cool. It's a great location for this little bar. And anywhere you're at really, um, you can, I'm always I always grab ice and stuff like that and, and clean my hands and I wipe them on my clean bar towel. Okay, I'm really conscious of that. Um, so and the only thing really cash yeah it's it's dirty and you're gonna it's the nature of the business. But you know so we're from the food background. Yeah, and we think it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And we think it's against health board to even touch a lime without having Kalama. <laughs> yeah, I no. Mean, but I mean, we really, you know, it really disgusts us. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it's just. I can't you know, just use a little yeah. tongue and pick up the lime and. But you can't put it on the. You can't squeeze it. Okay. Yeah. Get the right kind of tongs. Give it a squeeze. Or <laughs> no, you know, I I, I invented the something once and it was. Like, looking over our shoulder. I know. Yeah. I invented something once and it was on the order of a finger puppet. You know what I mean? And that's yeah, and I was like, yeah, you know, and I thought. It, I don't know. It's keep your hands clean. That's really it. It's really it. You know, I sure. Tom, pick. No, I know where I. You know, talked to us in the beginning. That's why yeah. I understand where he's coming. Yeah, from. you just can't. You just have to keep your hands clean. You know, and that's that's it. You know, I, there's you, everybody eats a, a peck of dirt in their lifetime, right? Uh, you know, and that's you know, then and some dirt is good dirt. Other dirt, you know, I, as long as you're not, as long as you're. The only germs are coming from the money and not from the guy's lips that was on this glass and the <laughs> coffin and uh, touching your face and all that stuff. Then you've got, you're controlling the amount of stuff that you're adding to the, the drink. It's just it's money. Money is dirty money. That's all right. You know. um, it's been in a pocket, got wiped off all day, whatever's on the guy's fingers. You know. Yeah, do it. Just be conscious of keeping clean. You know, it's 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 not practical to handle money and with gloves on and stuff. You'd be going through five dollars worth of gloves every day because you can't strap those things on and off fast enough. You know what I mean? You just it's just not practical. You, you can't. You know because otherwise, oh, I put a glove on. Yeah, now you're handling dirty money with a glove. All right, well that doesn't work. Right. I've seen guys do that in the kitchen too. Oh yeah, it's cool, man. I got this raw chicken. You know, okay, I got gloves on. And then they go over here and it's like, don't touch that lettuce, dude. That's you know, they still got the gloves on. They don't, you know, they don't, oh, it's, it's not you it's protecting, it's, it's, so, yeah. Gloves are, gloves should be in the kitchen, uh, and behind a bar, you, you, it's. Well, you never see them, but it's, you know. We'll have yeah. extra soap on, at the bar. Okay. Hand sanitizers, you know, I mean, you can have that. Then, of course, you know, you don't want to put the soapy lime yeah. and the guy's drinking. Oh, is that bubbles? <laughs> I thought I was like, oh, bubbles. No, that's the hand sanitizer soap, dude. You know? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't, I think I've covered everything. I, I, what could that be? I don't know. Do you, can you think of anything I haven't covered? I got a bunch of questions, but yes. it may not be, it may not be really for a whole group. And, well, what um, do you think? So okay. I, I have a Go question, too. So, at, like, weddings and stuff like that, yeah. do you, like, I don't know, are we, Mom, do you know if we're, are we discouraging, sh like we're not doing shots? Oh, like no shots. Stuff? No shots. I was just clarifying. Yeah. 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 Unless they're cinnamon schnapps. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would, I would highly discourage that. So if somebody asked for a shot, what do you say? No. You say I'm no, not serving no, shots. No, we're not doing shots. Yeah. So yeah, if they we're just talking. shots, they say no. Yeah, yeah, there's no shots. You know, always talk to the, you always want to talk to the people that are paying for the party and clarify that so they know. No shots, right? Oh, you know, okay. Um, you want to buy a bottle of Crown Royal? Okay, you know, it's you know, it's three hundred dollars or whatever it is, you know. And uh, yeah, we'll do shots all night long. But tell them, all right, if you if you want to do shots at this event, then I want you to sign something saying that anybody that's intoxicated is going to have a designated driver, because I'm not I'm not riding that ride. Okay, so that is negotiable. Uh, but really, shots, I wouldn't I wouldn't suggest. You know, I worked a lot of parties where guys, yeah, shots. No, we don't do them. What do you mean you don't do them? We don't do them. That's it. You know, unless he's the guy that you know ordered the party, and if it was the guy that ordered the party, he knows we're not doing it because that was brought up. You know, at the signing of the contract. Yeah. 
if we're working a wedding or something mm -hmm. and we know that they have rides back to their hotel or it's like in the hotel where they're staying at, yeah. then how do you decide when to cut people off? When they're <laughs> when they're visibly intoxicated and causing problems, like if they're okay. trash. Uh, you know, I mean, weddings, that's the crazy thing about catering. I mean, it's, a, it's an event where people are celebratory mood and yeah. there's a lot of booze for them. <laughs> We've you seen know? that, though. Yeah. We've seen yeah. that. And you have to, and you have to nip it in the bud. You have to get it. You know, this is why keeping score is coming <coughs> on the bartender and the service. It's a joint effort. You know what I mean? If you got, if you're serving. You got half a dozen tables at a wedding, and uh, the servers keep noticing, picking up that this guy's one guy is wasted. His glass. Where is he getting this from? So he could be sitting there, not even going to the bar. And his, his wife is bringing him back, or his buddies are bringing him a drink after drink after drink, and he gets up and falls down. You know what I mean? Or they come in, they pre-gamed, they come in, <laughs> yeah. half wasted, so much oh, the ceremony. That's where you really got to, yeah, I get that at the bars once in a while too. Right. Wow, like, this guy's yeah, gone, yeah, he's coming in. Dude, I can't serve you. Know? <laughs> uh, or if they come in almost there, so, uh, all right, one, yeah, one. But before I serve you, I, I just want to ask you if you're driving. Because if you are, I'm not serving you anything. If you, if you're not driving, I'll give you one, but maybe not anymore. You know, just you have to, you have to be friendly for and final, and and really safeguarding the public's interest is really what, what it comes down to. You have to. There's opportunity to save lives, and there's opportunity to have people get killed in the highway, and we're in charge of it. You know, and that's the dangerous part of it. It's a, it's a drug, it's a drug, it's a drug. Um, there's a biker guy in uh, Tonawanda last year, uh, maybe it was two years ago now, last fall, two, two falls ago. He's out on a motorcycle, a guy's in his 50s, he's my age, he's like 53 years old. He's driving his little scooter around uh, Tonawanda Creek Road, I think it was, a bike path. Two o'clock in the afternoon, it's 70 degrees, Indian summer day. He hits three people and kills two of them. You know, just on a motorcycle. These people are out for a stroll, walking by the side of the road on a bike path. He just went, nah, poof, and killed killed a lady and uh, and maybe a, I forget it was a guy who was walking with his wife. I don't know if it was a woman died and then just a, another stranger. I bowled him all over. And this guy had been somewhere drinking. He had a history of drinking and driving in like Ohio or somewhere. Crazy. But somebody served him, and that's going to come out. And it's like this doctor that got served. In what world do we live in that you can't see that this guy, is it because he's a doctor and he's at the country club? That, you know, I mean, that's it. There's a lot of peer pressure involved there. Biker bars, yeah, you know, you know, you get a bunch of rowdy drunks, yeah. That's why you have bouncers, this guy's cut off, throw him out, whatever, you know, consequences, fights. Country club, how could a doctor get all wasted and kill somebody? You know, hey, they get as drunk as anybody else, and you really got to realize that. The opportunity for intervention is there. And if we had these green, yellow cards, if somebody would have said, excuse me, doctor, but you're in the red zone, can we call you a cab? Because, or your wife, or somebody, because we've served you. You're at point two. You know what I mean? They never, you should never let anybody get over point one four. You know what I mean? I mean, that's over the limit by almost twice. But point two, point two zero, he's gone, you know, and he's been drinking all day, and so you really have to say, hey, it's time, step it up. We're we're the people in charge of this, you know, saving the lives, okay. Um, other questions? Can you shoot any of them? Yeah, and they may, you know, maybe crossing over you a little bit. If we decided on brand for the different levels, you know, we're. My drinking days have been over, you know, 30 years ago. Yeah. Ah. And I don't really even know. 30. Like we're talking about, like, what we used to think was, like, a top okay. shelf. We're talking catering bars. Oh, yeah. For each level, like, can you throw out Okay, yeah, here, here. For us yeah, for yeah, yeah, I've got this here. Uh, I've got this sheet. So we go with uh, tequilas, well, rum. And then I've got uh, vodkas for call vodkas, absolute, absolute citron, sky, smirnoff, stoli, tangeray vodka. Okay, and then you've got Janice, beef eater, Bombay, boodles, tangeray. Okay, those are standard. When you're organizing your bar, besides the uh, well setup, you organize within groups. So all your scotches are together. I mean, you're only going to have one scotch, one bourbon, one whiskey, one uh, of each category probably if you're going to the top shelf bar. 
But behind a regular bar, within each category, you alphabetize. So you know just where they're at. They're absolute citron, absolute regular, absolute citron, absolute orange. Uh, you know, so you get, so you can just go left to right and pick up. Stoli's going to be way down here, okay? Um, and Sky's going to be right next to it. Uh, so Rome's Bacardi, uh, light dark captain. You know, I can do this for you. I can, I can give you a starter kit of anything. You know. Um, a setup. If you if you go to a liquor guy, your liquor salesman, oh, you just got your liquor license. Well, you need Bacardi Limon, Bacardi Raspberry, Bacardi. It's like man, that stuff comes to you free, and uh, if you buy six of these, you get one bottle that you'll never use. You know that <laughs> stuff. And I, literally, we have at the bar we have Bailey's Vanilla, Bailey's Cinnamon Vanilla, something. You know that stuff that you just don't use. And you know, also the the liquor sales guys are expert at getting that stuff out and it will sit on your shelf forever, literally. You know what I mean? It's like, wow, we don't use this stuff. So really, order what you use and use it and fresh. We have beers, we've been open three years, I swear to God, there's still a couple of beers in bottles. We have like 50 bottle beers. There's probably some with a fresh date of two years ago. They just don't, they don't use, they don't move them and I think every Halloween we have a grab bag. Get them all in there, you know, it's like here, it's a dollar. <laughs> Good luck with that, you know. Good luck. So the so, brands you have here, I'm kind of familiar with. Yeah. But I you know, you keep hearing about all these other brands, you know, of stuff that are out there that are more current, like Grey Goose, for example. Those are Grey Goose. Kettle one, Belvedere. You know, it's like yeah. yeah. I mean, are these behind the times? Time? Those are events, but no, they're they're, no. they're real top. I people okay, are taking the top shelf. You see it more uh, upscale right. and. Offer, you know, I would say offer it as an option, certainly for the for the people that are signing the contract. But let them know, man. You know, um, this is the top shelf. You know, there's there's always been a duality too. There's the thought process of, well, if you if a bottle of regular vodka can only cost you five or six bucks, so you make more money on that. Why would you sell absolute? You know what I mean? Because it costs you twenty five bucks a bottle. Well, actually, you look at the cost of the drink per unit. You're pushing drinks out, and you're going to make, you know, the, the percent cost might be higher for a uh, higher priced item for liquor cost, but when it comes to unit cost, pushing a drink out, you'll make more money on a $5 drink than you will on a $3.50 drink, where, you, where you may be making, you may be making $2.75 on that uh, $3.50 drink, but you're making like 4 bucks on a $5 drink. So, uh, even though the ingredients can cost higher, the unit cost is higher, the transaction brings you more money and more profit. So we, so I don't think most of our stuff will be, most of our stuff will not be cash bar. No. Okay. You know, so, let me ask a past question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is there, like, some people are like, Great Goose is a really good example. Uh, my sister will only drink Great yeah. Goose vodka. Is there really such a, something to it that you can only drink, or is it just the name? I can tell you how smooth it is, about it. We did a, we had a, uh, at the casino <laughs> bar, we had a, they just redid all the bar. It was a, we worked at the hotel lobby, and they had Grey Goose bottles all lined all the way up along the back wall. Yeah. And uh, I was like, oh, how cool is that? So, on a busy night, so what we do, we start taking them down and using them. A couple of weeks later, somebody said, you know what, this is so smooth, man. This actually almost tastes like water. Now, me and the other bartender have been taking these down for two weeks using Grey Goose, and we saw a lot of Grey Goose. It was all water. <laughs> they were putting up empty, they were putting up empties. They were putting up empty bottles that they'd recorked with the, with the water, and it was de decor. They never saw us taking them down. That's how smooth it is. People that are drinking, they can't tell the difference. Why you? Yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, so, uh, yeah. so no, no, that's I, how smooth it is. I agree. So I, I, think, I think it's. I think it's the name. Yeah, I think the colder it is, I think the colder it is, it's pretty good. Yeah. But you know, it, it really yeah, smooths it out. But you know, I was never much of a whiskey drinker. <laughs> yeah. There you have it. What should a bar kit include? A bar kit. What you want to have, uh, you know, the Crown Royal bag. You want to have. Uh, your shaker tin, okay, uh, big and little shaker tin, strainer, okay, um, for your, uh, you want to have 10 pour spouts for your uh, booze, your wine service uh, opener, and then your um, beer bottle opener. That's a must haves. Uh, you want to have Bev naps and coasters, because they're really handy. And then stir, stir sticks, pour spouts. Uh, Sword picks, stir sticks, bevnaps, 
drink straws. Uh, ice bucket. Big ice bucket. <laughs> big, yeah, big ice scoop. Yeah, big ice ice bucket ice scoop. So yeah, the port you know port of bar. Um, everything's there for you. And you know, uh, I used to.